Okay, welcome to the Staphylococcus online lab. So sometimes when we do this lab, we kind of combine staph and strep, but I found that a lot of times when students do that, they end up kind of mixing up the key experiments for identifying each of these individual uh, strains within the genuses. So today we'll focus on Staphylococcus and then next time we'll focus on Streptococcus. But before we start focusing on the individual genuses, I do want to point out that both of these genuses are amongst the most important with regard to being two of the biggest uh, human pathogens. Okay, so I'm sure all of you have heard of staph infections, and most of you have probably gotten strep throat at one point or another. So you know firsthand that these are two big genuses. Now, because of how common they are as pathogens, it's important to be able to identify and distinguish amongst them because each of these genuses have many different species within them. Now, there are some similarities and differences between these two guys. The main similarity is that they are both gram positive. So if you were to do a gram stain, what would they look like? Purple, as you can see in both of these images here, okay, staph and strep, gram stain purple, and they're both caucus shaped, which means they're both round. Now you kind of got that from their name, staphylococcus and streptococcus, okay? Where they differ though is their arrangement. So if you look at them under a microscope, you notice that staphylococcus, which staphyle in Greek means grapes, they cluster like a whole bunch of grapes. So you see them clustering together. Whereas streptococcus, when you hear streptococcus, I always say, think strip of strep or strep strip, because they end up arranging in a linear fashion. They basically look like little chains or necklaces when you see them underneath the microscope. Okay, so when you hear staph and strep, remember both are gram positive, would be purple and round shaped in a gram stain, but they differ in their arrangement. So clustered versus linear. Now, because both are so common as infections, it's important to first be able to distinguish whether you're dealing with staph or whether you're dealing with strep. So the first way that you can help narrow down an infection that your patient may have is to do the catalase test. And with the catalase test, all you're doing is you take hydrogen peroxide and you mix a little bit of the bacteria into it. You could do this directly on a microscope slide or in lab in class, a lot of times we just do it right in an empty Petri dish, okay? So you take hydrogen peroxide and you put a droplet or a loop a colony of bacteria into it and you look to see what happens to the hydrogen peroxide, okay? Strep is what we call catalase negative, meaning it won't do anything to that hydrogen peroxide. So all you'll see is the regular bit of bacteria in the hydrogen peroxide with no change. Staph, on the other hand, is catalase positive, meaning they produce an enzyme that breaks down that hydrogen peroxide. And when it breaks it down into water and oxygen, what do you end up seeing? All of those bubbles. So suddenly your droplet of hydrogen peroxide will start bubbling if staph is present. Okay. Now, when you look at that, one of the tricks that I always think of is think of a bubbly staff of nurses in the hospital, okay? So when you see that bubbling, that tells you that it's staff. You may have seen this before in everyday life because if you've ever put in, um, hydrogen peroxide on a cut, sometimes on your skin, you'll notice you see the bubbling, which makes sense because what do you have covering your skin? A whole lot of staff. Remember, especially staph epidermidis. Now, three of the main species that you'll encounter when we talk about staph are staph aureus, staph saprophyticus, and staph epidermidis, which I just mentioned a second ago. Now, out of these 
three, even though they're all staph, they're very different with regard to their virulence and pathogenicity. So Staph aureus is the one that I want you to circle star highlight as the big bad guy. Okay, Staph aureus is the one that you're usually dealing with when you see or hear about a lot of the nasty staph infections. So whenever you're thinking pathogenic when it comes to staph, it's usually staph aureus. And it's not just skin infections, which you might assume when you hear staph infection. Staph aureus can also do nasty things like, you know, major GI issues. You can have staph aureus food poisoning, usually due to temperature issues and, you know, vomiting and all of that fun stuff. Or staph aureus can also be things like toxic shock syndrome, which I'll show in one of the next slides, where your patient can end up septic and having this horrible you know, bacteria all throughout their blood and lymph. Now, the other two that we have on this slide, saprophyticus and epidermidus, these are a lot of times just part of your natural normal flora. Okay, saprophyticus and epidermidus, they're usually not very pathogenic, but like any normal flora, they can become opportunistic. And when you hear opportunistic pathogens, that means that if you're immunocompromised or they end up in the wrong location, you could then have an infection. So for instance, saprophyticus, if it ends up in the wrong location, you can end up with a UTI. And epidermidus also, if it ends up moving around on your body, you can end up with certain skin lesions if you've, let's say, had an opening on that skin, or again, if you're immunocompromised, then it causes problems, okay? And so this is an example of the kind of skin lesions you can end up seeing with staph infections. Although, honestly, that's one of the more minimal ones. You'll see some nastier ones in a minute. So as I said, staph infections can get kind of nasty, very gross looking, okay? They can have uh, vesicles and bullas, which are, you know, those kind of, see here, a lot of bubbling of the skin. There can be breakdown of the outer skin, or this one here is the toxic shock syndrome that I was talking about where the bacteria ends up all throughout the blood, traveling throughout the body and creating very dangerous issues, which can be fatal. So now Staph aureus is capable of doing so much damage, but you might ask yourself, why is that? You know, how can Staph, something that, you know, you think of on your skin, end up so much more dangerous than the other ones that we just talked about, like saprophyticus or epidermidus? Now, the big problem with Staph aureus are the enzymes, the metabolic enzymes or end products that it's able to produce that can do some nasty things. So for each of these, I want you to know what they're doing to your patient if your patient ends up with a Staph aureus infection. The first one is coagulase. So if you've ever heard of coagulating, right, your blood coagulating, Coagulase is an enzyme that Staph aureus produces that will clot blood, okay? Clotting blood, which can be very problematic for a patient. Leukocytins, when you hear leuco or like leukocytes, leukocytins are enzymes or toxins that will break down white blood cells, okay? Destroy white blood cells. Hemolysins, on the other hand, Hemo, that's going to be dealing with your red blood cells. So he, hemolysin, sometimes you hear them pronounced as hemolysins. Uh, either way, they are breaking down red blood cells. Okay, so remember the first one is clotting blood. The second one is destroying white blood cells. The third one is destroying red blood cells, all of which are very problematic for your patient. Staph aureus can also produce DNAs, which can start breaking down DNA of cells, and lipase, which can start breaking down lipids, all of which are big problems. Now, because Staph aureus is such a problematic infection, you have to be able to culture 
these different staff and try and identify or distinguish whether or not your patient has aureus compared to the other guys. So one way to do this is by using MSA plates, mannitol salt agar plates, which you have already heard about in class. The MSA plates, they have two aspects. They have their selective aspect, okay? So the first bullet point is selective. The fact that they have salt in them makes them selective because only salt tolerant organisms will grow. What do we call salt tolerant organisms? Halophiles. Okay, so MSA plates are selective for halophiles. The other aspect of MSA plates that are value that's valuable to us is the fact that it's differential. So any bacteria that is a mannitol salt fermenter will change the red color of the agar to a bright yellow color. Whereas something like Staph epidermidis that is not a mannitol fermenter will not change the color of the plate. Now there's a trick to remembering which of our three staff will ferment the mannitol and change the plate to yellow. So what I always do is think of it as MSA, instead of mannitol salt agar, remind yourself that the mannitol plate will turn yellow for saprophyticus and aureus. Okay, so when you see MSA, think saprophyticus and aureus will turn the plate yellow. And why is that? Because both of them ferment mannitol. Okay, so make sure you know which ones will change the plate and make sure you know what's selective versus differential about this plate. The next test you can do for identifying Staph aureus is the coagulase test. Because Staph aureus, out of all three of the strains that we're working with in this um, lesson, Staph aureus is the only one that is coagulase positive, meaning Staph aureus produces coagulase and can clot blood. So the way that we test this in a lab is we use plasma. We use what I call bunny plasma, but which is rabbit plasma, okay? What you do is you take some of the bacteria, if it's unknown bacteria, and either you put a loopful or a couple of drops into rabbit plasma. You then look to see, does that rabbit plasma solidify and stay in the bottom of the tube, or does it remain liquid and you can still move your tube? Um, you could even invert the tube and see the movement. So again, if you ever see a small test tube of rabbit plasma that's suddenly stuck to the bottom of the tube, that tells you that Staph aureus is present and it coagulated that sample. If the tube remains liquid and you could still move it back and forth, then you're dealing with coagulase negative Staph, which could either be saprophyticus or epidermidis. The next way to identify Staph aureus is by looking at hemolysis. So Staph aureus, part of why it's so dangerous for you is that it's beta hemolytic, okay? Now there are three forms of hemolysis, which means three forms of how bacteria can either break down or not break down the red blood cells. The way we test which type of hemolysis is present is by using blood agar plates. So it'll look like a red version of the plates that you usually deal with in lab. And the reason why it's red is that it has 5% sheep blood in it usually. Now, if the bacteria that you are streaking on it produces beta hemolysins or is beta hemolytic, then what you'll see is a halo of um, clearness around that culture. So wherever that bacteria is present, the red will disappear because that bacteria is breaking down. You, pick, you can picture it chewing up all of those red blood cells. So you see the bacteria there present, 
and all around it has become clear, which sometimes looks yellowish in pictures, okay? So that guy has destroyed all of the red blood cells in that area. That's what beta hemolytic means, okay? Beta, the trick that I use to remind you how bad it is, is just say beta bad, that B sound. And the reason why it's bad and the most pathogenic is because it's completely destroying the red blood cells. Whereas alpha hemolytic, which you see here, wherever the bacteria is, you see a change in color of the reddish plate to kind of like this greenish brownish look because the bacteria is partially breaking down the red blood cells in that area. Okay, it's not fully breaking them down, so you can't see through the plate yet, but it's partially breaking it down, so you see a color change. That's alpha hemolytic. It's not as bad as beta because it's not the complete destruction of all of the red blood cells. The last one is gamma hemolytic, and what you notice is no change in the color of the media. This bacteria is not breaking down any of the red blood cells. Okay, so you won't see a change in the red plate. Make sure that you remember that out of these three, beta, alpha, and gamma, beta is the bad one. It's the worst one, most pathogenic, and that's because it destroys completely the red blood cells. Now, we were just focusing on kind of um, identifying Staph aureus, but sometimes after that, once you realize your patient doesn't have Staph aureus, you still want to determine, is it epidermidus or is it saprophyticus that they're fighting? Because that can affect what kind of treatment that you may need to give them. So one way to distinguish the remaining Staph is by doing the novobiosin test, okay? As I mapped out here, you notice that aureus and epidermidus are sensitive to novobiosin, that antibiotic. So if you culture the bacteria on an agar plate and you put a small disc containing novobiosin antibiotic in the center of that plate, you'll notice that for aureus and epidermidus, there'll be a big zone of inhibition because they're sensitive to it. Okay, so that novobiosin has killed all of the aureus or epidermidis near it, whereas saprophyticus is resistant to novobiosin. So saprophyticus, you won't see any zone of inhibition. Now there's a trick to remember how the novobiosin test can uh, help you identify staff, which staff you're dealing with. The trick I always use is sap is sticky. Think of sap from a tree. So when you see a novobiosin disc where the bacteria is able to grow right up against it and look like the bacteria is sticking to the disc, that tells you it's saprophyticus. Sap is sticky. Okay? So whenever you see multiple plates with novobiosin on them, one that does not have a zone of inhibition, that's saprophyticus. The other ones can either be aureus or epidermidus because both will look the same. So even though this one is specifically epidermidus, aureus would look exactly the same. So now to test or help identify what, you know, which staph infection your patient has, you can do any of those tests that we just talked about. So now I'm going to give you a series of results, and in the post lab, you're going to be asked to explain or identify, kind of really interpret these results on each of these slides. So for instance, the first result set that you will be asked to analyze, on this side, you are dealing with novobiosin test results. Okay, so three different bacteria, aureus, epidermidus, and saprophyticus, streaked on a plate, and each one, a novobiosin antibiotic, is placed in the center. So I want you to be able to explain the results that you're seeing here. Over on this side, the same three bacteria are streaked on plates, 
but this time they're MSA plates. So these are mannitol salt agar plates. And notice the difference in what happens to the plate when certain bacteria are present. Okay. Now, even though you can do all different tests for staph infections, if you combine MSA, sorry, MSA and the novobiosin test, you're able to identify all three types of staph, okay? Because you can clearly see the difference in the MSA result. Only one does not change color, so that I tells you who that guy is. And then in the MSA results, you can see which one does not have a zone of inhibition. That tells you that identity. And then lastly, the one that is yellow but still has a zone, who is that? Aureus, okay? So by doing these two tests together, you're able to quickly and easily identify each of the three strains. Like I said, you'll be asked more interpretation in the post-lab assignment. The second result set that you will be asked questions about in the post lab and we'll need to now practice identification of exact species is an MSA plate. Okay, so you have an MSA plate, you have unknown bacteria, J, K, and L, and based upon what you're seeing and what you've been told in this background of the, uh, the lesson, you should be able to give information about what the identities can be and why you're seeing any changes. In result set three in the post lab, you will be asked identification questions and explanation, having all of these unknown bacteria. And notice that this is the coagulase test so when you flip over each test tube, you are asking yourself, has the rabbit plasma in that tube now solidified and stayed stuck in the tube where flipping it does nothing? Or is it still liquid where when you flip the tube, it falls right down with gravity? Okay, so ask yourself which tube looks different and why that may be. If you have any questions or are having trouble interpreting this picture, just send me a remind message and I'll help clarify. You then have results set four. This is another example of the novobiosin test, but now instead of telling you which bacteria is which, you have unknown, so bacteria X, Y, and Z. And in the post lab, you will be responsible for answering questions, identifying and explaining how you do this identification. And then the last results is to show you a single plate that has three different bacteria with three different hemolytic abilities. And so you may encounter questions either on the hemolytic abilities or on the possible identification of the bacteria present. Okay, as I mentioned before, if you have any questions with interpreting the results for any of these five sets of um, results, just contact me in Remind and let me know and I will help clarify what you're seeing or what you need to do exactly. Okay? Thank you and have a great day.